Thank you very much, Lisa. So uh, yes, so in fact, there's going to be two parts to what I'll do. I'm going to give you a taste of lecture on pure mathematics, and then I'm going to say a little bit about, about the maths courses at the University of Nottingham afterwards. Uh, right, so we'll start with the taste of lecture on pure mathematics. I am Joel Feinstein. I'll tell you a bit more about myself in a moment. Um, I've got a blog um, at explainingmaths.wordpress.com where you can find out all about my ideas about how to try and explain maths to students. Well, anyone really. Uh, and uh, right, so who am I? I'm an associate professor. I work on pure mathematics and uh, I'm also the outreach officer in the School of Mathematical Sciences. So I actually organise events like this one and other community taster events and things um, to try and uh, explain mathematics to people. Uh, I'm also the teaching support officer this year, which means that uh, I help the first year mathematicians when they come in, start their course um, with the core modules, which is about half of the first year. Uh, I have drop in sessions and people can ask me uh, questions at any time, really. And uh, I also teach the introductory pure maths module, the first one that people see at the beginning of the first year of the degree. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that later as well. Uh, and uh, my work is, my research work is on Swiss cheeses. Well, and actually it's in functional analysis, but one of the things I specialise in is Swiss cheeses, which are these strange shapes which you get by taking a disc and punching out infinitely many holes, each of which is disc shaped, and you get these peculiar shapes like this, um, which if you choose the holes carefully, uh, you get all sorts of weird properties, uh, but I won't be going into that today. So this taster session, it's based on part of the first lecture from my first year module, Foundation of the Pure Mathematics, which I'll call FPM for short. And uh, you can find several complete sets of videos by now. Um, I don't recommend you to watch several complete sets of videos, but uh, um, you should be able to find some. You can find some on YouTube. Um, if you follow this link, it'll take you to a page which links to various different versions of the Pure Math videos. And I'm going to be asking you some questions today so you get a chance to participate. And uh, here is a URL. There'll also be a, a URL in the chat which you can find. It says to participate in the interactive, interactive activities today, uh, here's the link you can use on your mobile device or whatever machine you're using. Yes, uh, so in fact, I do this throughout my teaching. Uh, I always make sure to have some interactive questions um, and it gives me a chance to see how well people are understanding what I'm saying. And it also gives people to have a chance to find out how well they understand and it gives people a chance to try and convince their neighbours that they've got it right, which is actually one of the best ways to learn maths is to try and explain it or convince someone else. So I'm going to start you off with this question. Uh, so here's the first question I'm going to ask you, and you can vote on this whenever you like using the the um, link in the chat. And the question is, is one a prime number? And but the point I want to make in asking this question, because you've probably been told yes or no, is how important it is to know definitions when you're studying mathematics, because if you don't have a precise definition for the concept you're working with, then it's very difficult to know whether you've got the answer right or not. In fact, the answer usually depends on whether you're working with the correct definition. And so, I mean, maths is full of asking questions about things. Uh, and if you're not quite sure what the thing is, it makes it very difficult to answer, what, uh, answer the question. OK, so what I'll do is I'll just let you uh, give you a little bit longer to say what you whether you think one's a prime number or not, and then I will uh, show you what you've come up with. 
and then I'll explain what the issues are and why it's important to have a clear definition of a prime number. So I'll just give it a little while longer. It, uh, it, so far, everybody's voting for the same thing, so it does look like you've all been told whether or not one of the prime number or not. But um, if you've already answered, you might think about uh, why do you think your answer is correct? Have you been given a formal definition? Are you absolutely sure that your answer is right? OK, let's see what people have gone for. So we've got seven answers. Um, most people have gone for B, um, but we do have at least one person going for A. So let's just remind ourselves what those meant. So most of you think that one isn't a prime number. Um, one of you has gone for one is a prime number. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to think either way um, if you're not entirely sure of which definition you're working with. But OK, let me tick. Let me tick the no, because that's officially the correct answer. But I'm going to give you a definition in a moment. And once I've given you a definition, that will, uh, of course, tell you whether or not one's the prime number as part of the definition. But what you might be wondering is, I mean, you know, you, you know, prime numbers got something to do with, is it divisible by anything interesting or is it only divisible by itself and one? And then you think about one and you think, well, that's only divisible by one. Um, and so maybe one should be a prime number. But mathematicians don't want one to be a prime number. And there's a very good reason for this. In fact, lots of very good reasons for this. One of the reasons we don't want one to be a prime number is when you factorize uh, positive integers as products of primes, like a thousand, which you can write as two times two times two times five times five times five, writes it as two cubed times five cubed. Um, that's essentially unique. There's not really any other way of writing a thousand as a product of primes, except you could change the orders of the twos and the fives when you're factorizing it. But if you threw one in as a prime, then you could choose to multiply by one or by one squared or by one cubed or whatever. It wouldn't be unique at all. And that's just one of hundreds of results where you'd have to say, well, this works for all primes except one. Um, so ignore one. On, it's much better if you say, no, one doesn't count as prime. Um, so you don't have to keep saying except one, because one just isn't as good as the other primes um, from this point of view. There are other things, you know, two is also special because two is the only even prime number. Um, and so sometimes you have to say for all odd primes and sometimes you really have to do that. But anyway, uh, so that's one reason why it's important not to call one a prime number. But what I said is that we need to know some definitions in order to be able to decide whether things are true or not. So let's have a definition. Now, first, I've got to remind you what integers are, and that's just basically whole numbers, positive, negative or zero. So I'll write that down first. So integers are whole numbers. Um, which could be positive, negative or zero. Oops, or zero, try again. Um, so you've got all the non-negative ones but you've also got the negative ones. So those are the integers. And a prime number is an integer p uh, with p I'll just say with p greater or equal to 2, because that will rule 1 out straight away, such that. 
so that p isn't divisible by any other positive integers except for one and p. So p is not divisible not divisible by any positive integers except except for one and p. Um, what's this word positive doing in there? Well, uh, I want I want to make sure you know I'm dealing with integers. Uh, and sometimes I might be dealing with negative integers. And you might wonder, is two divisible by minus two? I don't want to get into that, so I'm just going to talk about whether you're divisible by positive integers. But notice that um, you can divide two by minus two and you'll get minus one. And that's an integer. So if you do start dividing by negative integers, you've got a few more cases to worry about. OK, so uh, now we know what a prime number is. I can give you another question. I'm going to ask you two questions about prime numbers. Let's start with problem two. How many prime numbers P are there with the property that the square root of P plus one is an integer? This is the non negative square root um, because mathematicians, when they write square root, that's a non negative square root. Now, you shouldn't find this obvious at all. But what you can do is try a few prime numbers out. And uh, see if you find any. Uh, then try and make a guess as to what you think the answer is. And then once you've got a guess, see if you can think of a reason. Because you see this one, well, I'll, I'll tell you more about the problem in a minute, but let me give you, uh, don't vote yet because uh, I, I need to just uh, get rid of all the previous responses. Okay, uh, you can you can vote anytime now, but I'm gonna give you about a minute, minute and a half to think about this one. Try to figure out what the answer is and see if you can prove it because proof is another stage again. So are you absolutely sure about your answer or are you just guessing? Give you a bit more time on that one. And if you've got anybody with you, try to convince them that you're right. Because best way to learn maths and understand maths is to explain it to someone else. Which is one of the things that our past leaders find out in Nottingham. Our peer assisted uh, study uh, system um, where um, our second, third and fourth years, some of them will help the first years with the difficult concepts in first year mathematics. And in the process, our past leaders also learn quite a lot themselves and really solidify their understanding of everything they're explaining to everyone else. So I think it's good for everyone. Right, let's have a look. Oh, I've only got one reply so far, at least. Uh, there is a bit of lag, so you're probably about 20 or 30 seconds behind me. Um, our now some answers are coming in and we're getting quite a lot of different answers. So that's good. Just give you a, a little bit longer because I've only got five answers so far on my display. Right, let's see uh, what people have come up with. OK, so um, it looks like most of you have gone for C, um, with some people for A, some people for D. Oh, it's, all sorts are coming in now, right? Uh, so lots of different, lots of different possibilities. Let me tell you that the correct answer to this one is C. There's only one prime number, P, so the square root of P plus one is an integer. And the majority of you of you have got that right, whether it's a guess or a, or a proof is not clear. 
at this point, uh, in, a, in a normal lecture, I would invite someone to be brave enough to explain why they think there's only one. But I think I won't do that today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll say something about this straight away. But if you figured out a proof that there's only one, you should be very pleased with yourselves because that's uh, a really good, a really good example of mathematical reasoning of the kind that you need to do in pure mathematics at the University of Nottingham. OK, so let, let's say something about this. First of all, um, which prime is it? Well, I think probably most of you will have found that three works. So notice three is prime. And the square root of three plus one is the square root of four, which is two. Remember, it's a non-negative square root. So three works. That's a good start. We found at least one. And then you try five and it doesn't work and seven doesn't work. And then hopefully you don't try nine because nine is not prime. And then um, you try 11. Oh, of course, two didn't work either. You probably tried that. And 11 doesn't work. And then you keep trying more and more. And you try 100 primes and none of them seem to work. And then you try a million primes and none of them seem to work. And But it doesn't help because no matter how many you try, the next one might work unless you've got a reason why it can't. And there are uh, the been conjectures in mathematics that have been true for the first billion numbers and then someone's found a counterexample, but it's much bigger than a billion. So just because you've tried a billion cases doesn't mean that you know what the answer is. You've only got a good guess unless you find a proof. So I said that I was going to talk about definitions, proofs and examples. Well, I talked about definitions already. Now we're talking about proofs. How can we be really sure that there's only one prime that works? Well, I'm going to give you a proof. If you thought of a proof yourself, well done. OK, so let, there'll be some mathematical language in this, which is what we always put around. But the main thing, the main idea, it's about factorization. So let's suppose. That P is a prime number. And that square root of p plus one, non negative square root, is some integer say we'll call that k. So k is an integer, and the square root of p plus one is equal to k. Uh, we know a bit more. P is a prime number, so p is at least two. The p plus one's at least three. We've taken the non-negative square root, so this is at least the square root of three, and that's bigger than one. So notice k is actually definitely bigger than one. Um, since p is greater than two, that's part of our definition of being prime, remember. Since p is greater than two, the square root of p plus one is at least the square root of three. Remember, it's the non-negative square root, which is greater than one, so k must be at least two because it's an integer. That might be helpful. OK, so that's just a little bit of information. If you can do this, the integer you get has got to be at least two. And in fact, of course, we know you can get two because if you take p equals three, then you get square root of four, which is two. So two is possible as well, but it's got to be at least two. OK, so we've got this information. Square root of p plus one is equal to k. And k is an integer. That's at least two. Let's square both sides. We get p plus one is equal to k squared, and so p is equal to k squared minus one. p is a prime is equal to k squared minus one. Now that might look suspicious to some of you because um, k squared minus one could be factorized as k plus one times k minus one. Uh, 
And so these two numbers divide P. P is divisible by these two, but P is a prime number. There aren't many things that divide prime numbers. Prime numbers can be divisible by P, by one, and maybe minus P and minus one, but notice K is at least two, so there's no negative numbers here. These are positive. So we're not talking about minus P or minus one, we must be talking about P and one. And obviously it's got to be K plus one that's P and K minus one that's one. So P is prime. The only positive integers that divide P are P and one, or one and P. So if I move up here, so we must have Well, these two divide P because you multiply them together and you get P. Um, so one of them must be P, and the other one must be one. And it's obvious that it's a bigger one that's P. So we must have P plus one, uh, sorry, K plus one equals P, kind of P plus one equals P. So we'll have K plus one equals P. And K minus one equals one. K minus one equals one, so K is two and P is three. And I'll do a little square to show I finished the proof because that tells you that if this happens, P has to be three. And that's how you do that one. Right, okay. So we've solved a question about prime numbers. I'm going to give you another one to think about. Uh, don't vote on this one yet. Let me, uh, you start thinking about it and I'll tell you when you can vote, but don't start voting yet because I've got to zero the answers. OK, I'm ready. You can vote at any time on this one, but you may have to think about it a bit. Do you think you can prove your answer? Do you have a guess? Um, you can vote any time now. Got no answers yet, at least, as I say, there's a bit of lag, so you may have already answered by the, t by the time you hear this. But I can't see any answers yet. OK, well, I've got my first answer. Well, if you haven't voted yet, uh, maybe you can. I expect the answer, maybe a few more will come in, but let me show you what I've seen so far, which is, oh, two responses now. There we go. So two answers so far, and you've both gone for B. Um, and maybe uh, some more answers will be trickling in in a minute. Uh, but oh, anyway, uh, so B, infinitely many. Well, that's probably right. OK. I'll put a question mark on that because it's probably right. But the real answer here is no one knows yet. OK, so A and B could both be right here. Um, I, I ask you to choose one answer, but in fact, um, the one that's known is that no one knows yet. This is one of Landau's problems. It's uh, a problem that uh, it's nobody even knows how to try to solve this one. Note, all I did was change P plus one to P minus one. And 
Oh, yeah, I can see an interesting question there, um, which I might, uh, somebody is asking about the number zero. And zero is indeed divisible by every single number you can think of, except possibly zero. So if I'm sticking to dividing by positive integers, zero is divisible by everything. Um, and that's very special. But of course, that certainly, it certainly doesn't count as a prime number. Um, so uh, how do you describe it? I mean, it's, uh, as it's what's called an additive neutral element, zero, and multiplicatively it's, well, a zero element. It swallows everything. If you multiply zero by anything, you get zero. Um, so it's got two very different roles um, for addition and for multiplication. Addition, it doesn't change anything. And for multiplication, it basically changes everything into itself. Uh, so zero is a is a very special thing, um, it's, but we call it the zero element of your algebraic structure, whatever it is. So I, I think that, that how would you describe it is as a zero, uh, probably, and, and I'm not sure about another way of describing it. Um, right. Uh, so where was I? Yes. Uh, nobody knows the answer to. Uh, to this one and nobody even knows how to begin about going to solve it whereas the one before we solved with elementary argument this one well what happens is this time instead of just finding one you can't find anymore this time you keep finding more and more and more and wherever you look you keep finding more but you uh, how do you know that you're going to keep finding more so this time as you go up to a billion, you keep finding more and more. How do you know that there's another one? But of course, you look further and you do find another one, but uh, because people have checked a long way and they keep finding more and more, but nobody knows if they go on forever. They're just, they're pretty sure it's likely. It's a bit, it's one of these things like, a bit like something called Goldbarth conjecture. It's one of these ones where people are almost sure of what the answer is going to be, but if you can't prove it, you're not sure. Um, so nobody's absolutely sure because there's no proof. Uh, look up Landau's problems on the web and you'll get more information about this. It's uh, it's quite fascinating. You might wonder why do we care about um, prime numbers and all this stuff? Uh, of course, a few hundred years ago, or even going right back to Euclid, I suppose, uh, thousands of years ago, but uh, Certainly a few hundred years ago, people were doing a lot of work on prime numbers and number theory, and nobody thought it was important for anything. It was just good fun. Really interesting, proving lots of mathematical results about prime numbers, and everybody thought this was just a really interesting and difficult game, if you like, to play around with prime numbers. Nowadays, um, encryption systems completely depend on what you do with prime numbers and the theory of that. And so what used to be just fun is now uh, completely crucial for the safety of your money online when you're doing shopping or internet banking or anything like that. Uh, so it may have been that prime numbers weren't important once or weren't known to be important, but they're extremely important now. So if you go online and look up encryption, encryption systems, you'll find it's full of number theory and prime numbers and things like that and uh, that's something you can learn a lot about if you come to university so yes you can learn about the number theory and the prime numbers and you can learn that just for fun or you can learn about cryptography and uh, coding cryptography and that sort of thing and uh, you can learn out how to apply it all in order to develop really good encryption algorithms and um, it is very important that the uh, the good people stay ahead of the bad people here um, because um, if if criminal masterminds become too good at number theory, they might figure out how to crack the encryption algorithms and then your money won't be safe anymore. But at the moment, um, the good mathematicians are winning and uh, nobody can crack the encryption algorithms at the moment. So you seem to be all right. Um, keep an eye on the news if they say, um, quantum computers now solve your encryption algorithms, your money is no longer safe, then beware. Okay, uh, right, so now I want to finish today um, 
when I say finish today, finish the, this taster lecture portion by talking about something called Simpson's paradox. And like most paradoxes in mathematics, it's not really a paradox. It's just an apparent paradox. It's something which appears to be impossible, but is actually true. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too long on this since since we've been going quite a while now, uh, but it's a competition, this one, between two bets. But actually, if you look up Simpson's paradox on, say, Wikipedia, you'll find loads of really of real world examples where this sort of thing happens. OK, so it's two vets, so they're competing. Vet A and Vet B, and they claim to be better at treating a certain animal disease. And Vet A says we're better because we cured a greater percentage of our male patients than you did, and we cured a greater percentage of our female patients last year than you did. Vet B says, well, that may be true, but we cured a greater percentage of all of our patients than you did last year. So I want you to have a think about that. And there's no tricks here. The, these animals are either male or female. Um, so, uh, and the numbers are not zero. None of the numbers are zero. So there's no, no tricks. Um, and I want you to think, does this seem even possible or must one of the hospitals have got it wrong? Could it be that one, one vet is better at treating male patients and better at treating female patients, but the other vet is better at treating their patients. I'll just give you a little, uh, a while to scribble on the back of your envelope to see if you can figure out any examples. And remember, if you want to find an example where this happens, you've got to find four numbers for each vet. Um, you've got to decide how many male and female animals they each treated and the number of each type that they cured. So I'll just give you a little bit longer and then I will reveal the answer or an answer. OK, so I'm going to give you an example where this can happen. Uh, when I was first told about this, I said, that can't possibly happen. I'm sure I can prove that can't possibly happen. There's no way that one of them can be better at treating male patients and better at treating female patients, and yet the other one's better at treating their patients. It just doesn't add up. It's not fair. Um, and I tried to prove it was unreasonable. And um, since some people said it could happen, I had to bear in mind the possibility that maybe it could happen. And um, remember I said I was going to talk about definitions, proofs and examples. If you can't prove something doesn't happen, that might be because of an example where it does happen. Um, and of course, when you find an example, that is also convincing. So here you are. In this table, percentages have been rounded to the nearest integer, but if you work them out exactly, you'll find I didn't cheat. Um, the rounding hasn't actually done anything to do any dam damage to this. So, vet A, 10 male patients and cured them all, 100%. Fantastic, you can't do better than that. Vet B, 90 male patients, but only cured 89 of them, which is basically a pathetic 99, roughly 99% cure, nothing like as good as 100%, right? And then for the female patients, vet A, 90 patients cured 50, 56%, that doesn't seem to be so good, but vet B had 10 female patients and only cured three of them. That's a, only 30%, miles worse than vet A. So vet A is better at the male patients and better at the female patients. But let's have a look at the figures for all patients. Vet A, 10 male patients, 90 female patients, that's 100 patients. Um, and the total cured, 60, about 60%. Right, Vet B, 90 male patients, 10 female patients, so that's 100 patients again, but they cured 92, 92% cured. Miles better than Vet A. So yeah, Vet A is better at curing its male patients and better at curing its female patients, but Vet B is better at curing its patients. Uh, well, there's usually an underlying reason for something like this. I don't know what it is. Um, I would 
be asking some questions of these vets. Why are so many female, why, are, why is it such an imbalance in the number of male patients and female patients going to each? And why are they both so bad at curing their female animal patients? And um, that doesn't seem right either. So if you look, um, quite often an underlying reason, a hidden variable, some information you don't have when this phenomenon happens that explains what's going on. But I have to say, I can't tell you which of these two vets to take your animal to. I really don't know. Um, perhaps, uh, there doesn't seem to be much difference in the male patients. They they seem to both be very good. The number of female animals doesn't seem to be very large here, so it's hard to be sure. Um, perhaps it looks pretty bad though that they only cured three of their ten female animals. Anyway, um, I can't say much more about that. But if you look up Simpson's paradox, you'll find there's loads of examples in real life where this sort of thing happens, and there's often a reason for it. But um, it, it's been done with uh, um, average scores in cricket. It actually happened in a competition between two brothers who were trying to, and uh, one of them had a better batting average over each leg, but the other one had a better batting average overall, something like that. Um, and uh, it wasn't quite clear who, who'd won their bet. Um, right, okay, so here are some useful links. Um, I'm gonna make these slides available later. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the, here are some links. There's a link to the University of Nottingham's uh, School of Mathematical Sciences at our maths courses. This one's the University of Nottingham. This one is our links to our maths courses if you want to study with us. This is a, a link to the complete sets of videos from my module Foundations of Pure Mathematics. And uh, there'll be a link in the chat where you can give a, a feedback on this session. But before we move to the Q&A, um, and please do give us feedback before you leave, um, I, should, I have to warn you that uh, when, when we finish this session, the, uh, uh, when the event ends, the chat will disappear and you won't be able to get back to it. So if you could memorise that URL in case you want to give us feedback later, that'd be very good. Uh, right, so I'm going to move on now to tell you something about the maths courses at Nottingham. But if you do have questions.